Keith, I really appreciate your time. Um, I've known Keith a long time. I was thinking on the ride over here, I think I met you in the mid-90s somewhere, and I met you right here in the old lab, that's where I met that's you. Right. That's right. So that's yeah. been a while. There's a lot of beekeeping history right here on the UGA Bee Lab Absolutely. grounds. Absolutely, it brings back a lot of memories from when I was a younger person, maybe you were too. Uh, I may have been <laughs> A little too. less gray. <laughs> Anyway, so what I'm doing here today, I'm really keen on this concept of polyandry, and Keith is an expert at it, so I figured he'd be the right person to uh, ask questions. And again, this is very casual. I'm not even sure. I should have a nice official list of questions to ask you, but you're so smart on this, I don't even think I have to go there. Um, polyandry. When I looked up the definition of polyandry online, it would show a picture of a woman surrounded by four or five husbands. <laughs> so that's what, how, when you bring up the word of polyandry, I think that's the concept that comes to most people's minds. But you know, when we're talking about honeybees, it's something much different. I'll, I'm just going to let you talk. I don't need to say much here. Just tell us what you think we need to know. Well, thanks for giving me the chance to talk about it, Bob, because I think polyandry is not only interesting from the perspective of honeybee evolution and why we have the insect that we know today. I think polyandry has a lot to teach beekeepers on how we can uh, make our hives healthier and more productive. We are not really at a point yet where we can practically translate polyandry into practical beekeeping, but we're getting proof of concept that it's, it's, a, it's a thing that we must find a way to marshal and exploit and get it incorporated into our practical beekeeping. So it's a, a very fertile field, in my opinion, that needs a lot of work. But the promises are just um, are really sky high. And I hope to kind of convince you and your listeners today just how important polyandry is. Well, you convinced me when I listened to you talk about it at the Clarksville Bee Club. That's, that's why I'm here. Oh, I, I want to hear it all over again for, yeah. for the YouTube folks. So. Mm -hmm. Um, shoot, tell us about it. Well, I think there's a, there's kind of a couple ways to go about it. You know, polyandry is um, important to the history of the insect over its evolutionary time. And there is a pattern that happens in biology where there are lower units that get sucked up into a bigger unit and then get sucked, those get sucked up into yet bigger units and those get sucked up into yet bigger units. So it's kind of like a, a hierarchy. And at every stage, we call that an evolutionary transition. And in, in this slide that I'll be showing you here, we have an example of that where you have like unrelated nucleotides just floating around in the primordial ocean and how those are independent entities that reproduce on their own and then they glom together into chromosomes. Well, then the chromosomes reproduce on their own and then they get caught up into cells and then the cells reproduce on their own and then cells get attached to other cells and voila, you have a multicellular organism and that's the level where you and I are. We and all humans and organisms are multicellular organisms and for each one of these steps to occur there has to be a, a tacit agreement amongst all the lower units that hey we're going to suspend our selfish interests and reproduce uh, together as a member of this new unit. And if they don't agree to that, that transition, by definition, can never happen. So there has to be this genetic agreement at each one of these steps. And so I'm interested in this process because it, it, um, it's general across all of life evolution, and it's especially highlighted in the honeybee. I think the cool thing, Bob, for, for your listeners and those of us listening who like honeybees and beekeeping, uh, they are higher than we in this ladder that I'm describing because we are organisms. Well, they are super organisms. So in the case of honeybees and other super organisms, you have individual organisms like worker bees who come together and they make that tacit agreement that they're going to suspend their selfish interests in the interest of the colony. So there you have it, one more step. 
Well, it takes me into all kinds of ideas about politics and the world and, <laughs> and the universe and so on. But there yeah. is. There yeah. is a lot of lessons there. Of, and, and, and one of the things that's beautiful about evolution, a lot of times it is uh, lampooned for being selfishness, unbridled selfishness. And people in our history, in the last couple hundred years especially, have, have, have chafed against it as a yeah. lesson in selfishness. But the flip side of that is cooperation. And cooperation is just as important as selfishness in the history of evolution. So we can never forget that half as well. So this is the big framework of everything to do with polyandry. And once you get to the superorganism, there's actually another, there's, there's superorganisms that are simple and there's superorganisms that are complex. And uh, in this slide that I'm going to show you right here, we, we talk about some of these differences. Simple ones have a, a, a single mother who's mated to one male, and they produce very small colonies. And, and examples of this are your bumblebees. Most of their females just mate with one male. And your wasps, many of them mate with just one male. And so you have the, they're, they're a superorganism, but they're a very simple superorganism. There's not a lot of genetic stuff happening there. They're all super sisters with one another. Well, the flip side of that is the complex superorganisms. And with these, the mothers don't stop with just one male. They mate with multiple males. And this really upsets the formula because now you have colonies that are very genetically diverse. And it's no accident that it's in these complex superorganisms that we find the highest expressions of sophistication in the social insects. This is where you find the termites and the ants who rule planet Earth. And this is where the honeybees are. And it's because of the multiple mating habit of the females that they get different castes, different specialists, different um, all of the, the group decision-making behavior, the waggle dance, all of those sophisticated behaviors only happen in the complex superorganisms. The simple ones just don't have it. So it's easy to get this concept in a beehive. You know, different colonies, for instance, will have maybe one's a good honey producer, one's really good at hygienic behavior, one's really good at defensiveness, and you can have all of those things going on in a colony at one time because you have yeah. that genetic diversity. Exactly, that's a brilliant point, Bob. You know, one colony uh, doesn't have to be just one thing. Yeah. In fact, that's rather unlikely. It's very unlikely that a queen will have mated only with drones that are good honey producers. Yeah. Um, but well, yet she's cranking out drones with her genes and so you get colonies that have a little bit of everything and that's the big advantage to the complex superorganisms. Okay so from a beekeeper point of view I guess we're looking at the possibility there's two questions here we're looking at the possibility of a colony actually changing personality midstream over the period of a couple of years and still have the same queen because she's made it with so many drones so that begs the question when a queen mates is the sperm layering or is it mixing mm -hmm. is she putting out all of these different uh, characteristics at the same time or can she just put out one characteristic and then suddenly the colony changes personality mm -hmm. in midstream and does something completely different that question is very persistent and it has been around you know, my entire career and there's a reason for its persistence and that's because in the scientific literature there's evidence for both. Most of the older literature, which is back in the 50s and 60s, had some evidence for layering happening, as you're talking about. <clears throat> so that a particular drone would be overexpressed for this period of time, for example, and then a different drone later on. But that model has been pretty much laid to rest and abandoned because the majority of later evidence says that it does mix. So the majority of our evidence is that the sperm mixes. And that makes sense from an ecologic point of view, if you think about it. If polyandry is beneficial, then you want it to be beneficial all the time. 
Yeah, and of course, just looking in a colony, you can see the different bees. Yes. Some will be darker, some will be, we call it salt and pepper, salt and pepper in a colony. Right. Uh, both types of colors going on at one time. Yeah, it's true. They, yeah. And there's, you know, a thousand environmental reasons that can make a colony change its temperament, too. Oh, sure, too. yeah. So it's, but the majority of evidence is that the sperm is mixed. Okay. Okay, so now, next question. If you've got mixed sperm and a queen, and you have a colony that you really like and you want to use that queen to uh, graft from, nah. what are we looking at? I mean, you know, you may not be getting the, the exact trait that you're hoping for when you pick that queen out as a breeder. Absolutely. And Bob, you're, you're kind of getting to the heart of the matter as what, of what made me go into this line of research in the first place. And you're absolutely right. Um, let's keep things simple and say that a an average queen mates with 10 males. Okay. Usually it's 10 to 20, but let's say it's 10. And let's say that you are interested in honey production. And you find this colony right here, by God, this honey doubled, tripled the yield over all the rest. I'm gonna graft from this queen. Well, it's perfectly logical, isn't it? And so you go in there as a human, wielding your grafting tool and you're filling your cups with the larvae, but it may be only one drone among those 10 who expresses the character that, that affects the entire colony that you as the beekeeper like. So on average, only one in every 10 eggs you graft is gonna be you know, carrying on the trait that you're interested in. So this is a built-in inefficiency in classical breeding with honeybees. And for most of my lifetime, Honeybee breeding has been dominated by breeding models from other livestock, you know, mammalian livestock models, which follow the paradigm that you just described. Hey, I like this cow. It's a great milk yielder. I'm going to propagate Bessie here because she makes more milk. But that's, you know, really it iffy doesn't, doesn't work. With, with, with honeybees. Like you can graph the bar and every larva on there could have a different trait. Absolutely. So it's got huge variation mixed into it. So. Yeah. Well then take, take Bob the next step in that process. <laughs> we have these virgins that we have grafted, which are already one in 10, let's say, yeah. that's got the brass ring. Well now let's turn them loose and let them mate in the open. Yeah. And it's kind of like a Wild West show. And so we should be amazed that we get anything at all accomplished in traditional honeybee breeding programs. Okay, so I know you're an excellent artificial inseminator. <laughs> So let, let, let's go down that rabbit hole. Uh, yeah. Yes, I want to talk about that. I got a little image right here that you can show your viewers. And this is a, tympic, a typical Schley, S-C-H-L-E-Y, uh, insemination device. It's what I learned from Dr. John Harbo when I was in graduate school at LSU. And, and it's been my most important tool my entire research career here at UGA. But, but this remains the only practical way that we can absolutely control mating number in queen bees. So you still got to find that drone. Yeah. So does that mean that the, the, the genetics or that line of drones has to come from an artificially inseminated queen to get what you want? If you really want to control this, yes. And here's often what happens. Um, Classical queen breeders will make use of single drone inseminations an awful lot. So you raise a bunch of virgin queens and you inseminate each one of them with just one male, which is not natural. No. But it's it, that way when you get a colony that's an expressing a character that you want, you got a really high probability that every egg you graft is in fact going to be carrying that trait. So it, it dramatically eliminates all that messiness in an open mated queen. So that's an important tool in bee breeding. So you can you know, graft from these daughters from singly male inseminated mothers and improve that precision quite a bit. Of course, you still have the maternal side variation that's messing things up. Yeah. But it still allows for extremely well controlled crosses. So, uh, this is changing the subject a bit. I may be putting you on the spot and you may not have a good answer. When a colony inbreeds to a pretty good degree, you get all kinds of weird things going on. First thing that comes to mind is uh, 
uh, aggressive bees. What's going on there? Do you have a clue how you would get an aggressive colony from inbreeding? I've seen it a number of times. Inbreeding, in my view, can cause aggressiveness. If you have a lot of inbreeding going on, and if you have aggressive alleles in your population, uh, they are equally likely to be among the alleles that are expressed dominantly. You know, uh, dominant, dominant, you know, on either side of the chromosome in your workers. And so if you have aggressive alleles in your population, and if that population is inbred, then that could be one of the characters that is overexpressed. They're just nasty. Equally, you could have really bad uh, thermoregulators. You know, you, yeah. the, the, the opposite could work. You could be get, getting overexpression of, of, of negative traits or recessive traits, mutations that are non-productive. That's what inbreeding does. It exaggerates those alleles that are the same on either side of the mother-father so, divide. Uh, you remember the star line, midnight line? Yes. Uh, that was very interesting. They would. My understanding was they would inbreed them to the point of near collapse yes. and then take two separate lines and breed them together and come up with an extreme hybrid figure. Yes. I never could quite wrap my head around that, why you could take two really, really bad lines because they were, they were so severely inbred then suddenly come up with a queen that was really superior. Mm -hmm. Of course, you'd lose that the first time that colony swarmed or superseded that hybrid vigor would disappear. Can you, are you able to explain this a little bit? Yeah, well, what you get, and this principle applies to hybrid crop production as well. You know, hybrid corn, for example, employs the same method. They will inbreed different parental lines, and these parental lines are just pathetic. I mean, they're weak, spindly little ears of corn. Just like the bees. Pathetic, yeah. just like the bees. And what, what inbreeding means is that the individual has the same form of the gene from its mother and from its father both. And nature in general does not like that. If you have an individual up and down its chromosomes that has the same form of this gene, same, 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 up and down the chromosome, it's, 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 a, it's almost a common law of biology in, ants, in animals and plants that those individuals are very uh, poor, poorly productive. They're not vigorous. They're very immune. To, they're, they're very prone to other kinds of maladies or disruptions or, or threats. They don't have the genetic diversity. So if you have two parental lines in which every form of the gene is the same, 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 same with the male line and over here the female, it's the same but different a different form, but same, 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 same. And then their gametes form, cut in half. You got the egg over here, the sperm over here, and you bring them together. Pow! Now what do you have? You got different, 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 different. You have the exact opposite extreme now. Every gene has the opposing form of that gene from the mother and from the parent. And this is what a hybrid is. Maximum diversity at every gene locus. Okay. And, and nature loves this. Okay. Now let's go down another rabbit hole. Haploid, diploid. Yeah. How many creatures on planet Earth do that? There's quite a few. There are, there are surprisingly quite a few. They, they are overrepresented in the arthropods, which include the insects. Uh, in the order Hymenoptera, which includes the ants and the wasps and the bees, it's universal. Really? All males in the ants and the wasps and the bees carry just one set of chromosomes. Uh, it also occurs in, coincidentally, uh, the mites that we're familiar oh, with. Oh, really? The tracheomites have the well, yeah, they, diploid system. Yeah, that's an interesting thing, constantly inbreeding. Yeah. yeah. I.e., that's another thing that I don't quite get a handle on. Well, there are exceptions, and that's the thing about biology. It loves exceptions as well. And there are times in species for which inbreeding is not a problem. And wouldn't you know that our chief nemesis, the Varroa mite, is one of them. It can yeah. handle enormous levels of inbreeding with no apparent loss of vigor whatsoever. Mm. How many, I know we're here talking, forgive me, we're going, my mind just comes yeah. up with all these questions as you're talking. Uh, how many, I don't know if species is the right word, how many different Varroa mites are there? 
I don't know the offhand. I'm thinking there's in the neighborhood of five or six. There's roughly 20 species of Asiatic mites of the genus Apis. So there's not only other Asiatic mites, there's other species of honeybees, Apis, yeah. um, concentrated <laughs> in Southeast Asia. And they all, every Apis in Southeast Asia has its own co-evolved parasitic mite. Varroa is the, the Varroa destructor that we're most familiar with as honeybee keepers is the natural parasite of the honeybee Apis serrana from Southeast Asia and through human trafficking it's been spread throughout the whole world now. This is another conversation in its own right, yeah, Bob. I know. That, that, Getting um, off subject. But... Lo- well, it's, <laughs> in, it's not irrelevant. Um, honeybee, the western honeybee that you and I um, keep, alone of all the genus Apis, it is the only representative of its genus that has no Asiatic mite, which is strong argument that the lineage of Apis mellifera uh, never evolved from Southeast Asia and that it is its own independent lineage probably evolving in Europe because it has no history whatsoever of an Asiatic mite. Mm -hmm. And this is an important point, you know, it's a little bit down a rabbit hole for our purposes right now, but actually I can kind of loop back and talk about this. Help yourself. With, like, with like I said earlier, we can't see anything wrong well, here. Just have at it. Yeah, but, but it's, it's, um, you know, it, it's important to realize, as beekeepers do, that genetic resistance in honeybees against varroa mite is the holy grail. Absolutely. We, I mean, that's, that's, that's what we're all wanting and working for. I think it's important for us to temper those expectations with the knowledge that mellifera has never, ever, ever had an Asiatic mite in its lineage. So when we come around in the 20th and 21st centuries and we say, I'm going to breed a varroa resistant honeybee, you know, the, the question is how? With what tools? With what genes? The insect doesn't have them. Where are they going to come from? Are you, Mr. Breeder, going to invent new genes? No, that's not what breeding does. Breeding resorts genes and concentrates them in individuals and in lines, but it doesn't create new genes. So whenever we do find lines of honeybee that express resistance to varroa mite, and they do exist, yeah, we all know, I know about they do, this. Yeah. When we do find that, it's important that we recognize that the honeybee is co-opting a different tool to a brand new job. In the case of varroa sensitive hygiene, for example, the hygienic behavior, which is natural to Apis mellifera, is an evolved response to brood diseases. Yeah. And it has just been sort of tweaked and shaped and formed and edited to be effective against varroa mites in brood. And it works to some degree. But you lose it quickly. Like you if, do. You, if you, um, I'm keeping it simple, but if you were to buy a, a, a varroa sensitive hygienic queen from somebody, bring it into your outfit, the first time that colony swarms or supersedes, what happens? You lose a lot of it is my understanding. That is very true, and Bob, you are just a fountain of talking points because there's a there's a, there's a reason for that. There, there explain, is a reason. Explain for that. the reason. There are, um, and it's 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 intuitive when you think about it a little bit. It's the principle of too much of a good thing. And there is a principle in animal breeding that if you have alleles, which is simply a form of a gene that's out there in your population, that are outrageously beneficial for a particular thing that nature has evolved for those super beneficial traits to be rare and recessive. And if your viewers can remember your, uh, you know, your high school biology or, or college biology, um, there are forms of genes that are dominant and recessive. And so these highly specialized alleles have been evolved to be rare and recessive, which means it's harder to express them. The mother has to have it, the father has to have it, in order for that double recessive to be in the child and for that benefit to be expressed. Why 
would they be rare and recessive? It's beneficial. Why in the world should, should, should nature evolve for these hyper-potent beneficials to be rare and recessive? Well, you can have too much of a good thing. You can get that trait locked into a breeding population so that it is extremely good at resisting that one potent thing to the cost of everything else. And I can give you a, a good example. Hygienic behavior can be overexpressed. Yeah, I know that. Yeah. Let's say, for example, well, hygienic behavior, it's beneficial, right? You know, you want your bees to have it. Um, but if you have it locked in your population so that every drone and every and, and the queen that he's mated to, they're all expressing hygienic behavior. All of the workers are are dominant dominant for recessive for, for hygienic behavior. You will have too much hygienic behavior. You will have nurse bees that are going around aborting and jettisoning perfectly healthy brood, and this happens. Well, occasionally you hear about these bees being non-productive. Mm -hmm. Is that the simple reason in a nutshell? It's certainly certainly part of it, overexpressing a good trait. Mm -hmm. I, think of, I think of these beneficial traits as sort of like Tabasco sauce. You, you want a little bit of them scattered throughout your worker population, but you certainly don't want to drink the whole bottle. <laughs> okay. And this kind of bottle, <laughs> this kind of ropes us back into our original topic about polyandry. Okay. And it is very likely that one of the evolutionary drivers that pushes these females to be promiscuous, you know, to molt with many males, is to cast a wide net, not only that she picks up that drone over there that's carrying that beneficial gene, but also that she mates with the other 99% who don't have it. It's the flip side of that because it's equally important that she not overexpress that really beneficial trait in her colony or else it will become ecologically uh, non-competitive. It'll be really good at resisting varroa mites and maybe really, really bad at thermoregulation or pathetic at foraging for nectar or something. It'll be too specialized. And because it's so potent in near time, it gets rapidly fixed, and that's a danger. Again, nature, on average, prefers diversity over specialization. Hmm. Polyandry, that's an interesting word. I, I would challenge everybody to look it up uh, online and, and look at all the different definitions of it. It's a crazy word. I want to tell you, I think it's, um, we would be remiss, Bob, to not talk about some of the work that we have done that I think has real practical application to beekeeping. I, I was going to go there with you. I didn't know if I'm allowed to ask you questions about the new vaccination. Is that where you're going? No, I'm still not done with polyandry, but then okay, we'll, all right, we'll, we'll get to the vaccination. Okay, because I, I know your listeners are curious about this. And, and yeah, it's, about a, it's this. a biggie right now. Go ahead. I want to talk a little bit more about the use of polyandry to solve the genetic problems that we're dealing with in beekeeping today. And um, I have done quite a bit of work the last 10 years on trying to translate polyandry into practical stuff for beekeepers. And what we did, I want to show you a slide right here that kind of I think will uh, be helpful to your, to your audience. We did an experiment when I was living in England on sabbatical where we inseminated queen bees with three different numbers of drones. We inseminated some of them with 15 males, some of them with 30 males, and some of them with 60 males. And these males were totally unselected. Mm -hmm. They were just a random random drones from any particular colony. And then we reared these queens, we inseminated them, established them in colonies, and then we measured them for brood production and their mite loads. And what you're seeing here is a significant increase in brood production in those queens that were inseminated with 30 or 60 drones, oh. above and beyond those that were inseminated with 15. So these are significant differences. So. Over here, we now have the same numbers for mite drop 
and the bars are going in the exact opposite direction, which is good, because there was significantly more mites in the queen's colonies that were inseminated with only 15 males, and it was significantly lower mites in those queens inseminated with 30 or 60. That's interesting. Now, these are two of perhaps the most important economic traits for beekeeping. Big populations, low varroa mites. I mean, what more could you want? This is great stuff. And this is a perfect example of what you can get with polyandry in the complete absence of breeding. I think of polyandry as almost anti-selection. We did not breed for drones that produced high brood. We did not breed for drones that produced low mite levels. But simply by filling our queen's spermatheca with sperm from a lot of males, we got both of these economic benefits. Okay, so let's put this into a practical application. I read an article a long time ago, probably 30 or 40 years ago. Um, it was a question answer in one of the bee journals. and The question was, how many support colonies should you have uh, producing drones for a certain amount of virgin queens? And this man answered six support colonies for every 100 queen mating nukes and I thought that doesn't sound like enough. I've always been a proponent of the more drones the better. You just get better queens. Just looking at the colonies it's obvious that what you're getting is something better. So when you're, if you've got several hundred queen mating nukes out in the pasture, I like to say we, we try to surround them with three very populated bee yards. We're getting a lot of drones in the air, millions maybe. I don't know how to calculate that. We always have better queens. We always have less supersedure. Um, so that's kind of the practical application of this idea, isn't it? It is huge. It is huge. There is one more that I will get back to here in a minute, but I want to pause on this one since you brought it up. The number of matings in a drone congregation area you know generally range from 10 to 20 but it's also there's evidence uh, my colleague and friend dave tarpey at nc yeah, state has done yeah. some work on this and he has shown that a lot of times the numbers are just random that it is so chaotic when you are in when you are a virgin queen flying through a comet of young randy drones the numbers of copulations can happen breathtakingly fast and I know this in part from my work at LSU. We would go out and study drone congregation areas, and you could hear them exploding in the sky oh, really? like popcorn. I've heard that. I've never yeah. heard it. Yeah, and they'd come raining down on top of you. But, I've heard of that. But the, the mating can happen just pow, 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 really fast. And so a lot of times a queen can just accidentally end up getting inseminated of up to 70 drones. And Dave's group has, in fact, shown, Dave's, Dave Tarpey's group possesses the world documented record for the number of natural matings, and it's over 70. Wow. They have found queens mated with over 70 drones. And it's very likely that it happens just out of randomness. So they found sperm from 70 yes. drones in a queen? In a single queen. Wow. So this supports what you're saying. We want huge drone congregation areas to allow those happy accidents to occur with greater frequency. So uh, when I'm talking about queens um, to a group of beekeepers, I kind of beat up on some of the big queen producers in South Georgia and other areas, how they're trying to get these queens out early. And the bees really do have a sense if the queen is not mated she might be well mated with a few drones and have a good brood pattern and you know she's accepted and she does a great job but we find this early super seizure i i'm thinking the bees have a sense that she's not mated with a lot of drones and they want to replace her is am i really that's true with that? but the queen herself also monitors this um there's no evidence that queens can count even and experiments have tried to test that you know, maybe she's keeping a count she has an image an idea in her mind of how many matings she needs the real driver is more likely the volume of sperm that she feels in her median oviduct because she does have a nerve supply mm -hmm. to the median oviduct and she can tell when she's distended with a lot of semen well how does that relate to the colony wanting to supersede her early well Sometimes she may adjust her expectation downward if there's not a lot of males in the neighborhood. 
And they have shown this with research in Poland, that a, a queen where there's lots of males, that queen's threshold for how tight she wants to feel in her medial oviduct is higher than if she's in a neighborhood with fewer drones. In other words, she lowers her expectations. And she says, well, I'm not encountering very many males, so I guess I'm just going to quit. I guess this is as good as I can do. And she goes back to her nest and she's done. So this reinforces the importance of huge drone congregation area populations. You want her to just be pow, 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 encountering lots of males. Hmm. Uh, can I drag you down another subject? You, you, and you may not have an answer for this, but uh, there seems to be some research showing that uh, when a queen lays less eggs, in other words, a queen in a small colony, you know, Brother Adam was all about this, keeping your breeder queens confined to a smaller unit. He felt like the eggs were bigger and better and would produce better larvae if the queen was restricted in her egg laying. Do you buy into that, or do you have any information on that? Hmm. You know, I, have, I can't say that I know about that, and I'm groping to understand a mechanism. What would make them the eggs? Are they able to be, well, I, I'm, I'm guessing, yeah. maybe a little more nutrition in the egg because she's not ah, producing so okay, many? Okay, okay. Uh, right. Well, I mean, that sounds plausible, but I, 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 I don't know, Bob. Okay, uh, that, that I stumped like Keith. Guess. I didn't know I could do oh, that. That's, <laughs> trust me, that's easy to do. <laughs> well, before we leave this subject, before okay. we talk about vaccines, I do want to um, make your listeners aware of one more way that we can approximate polyandry, and that's through brood mixing. And I have two slides here that I'll share with you and, and your viewers. Uh, let's say you have three colonies here that are coming out of winter and there's the brood combs. Well, you can redistribute those combs like this. So you have one of each brood comb now scattered amongst these three colonies. And the premise here is if a queen, once again, just keep things simple, if she averages 10 matings, we could say that each one of these queens is mated to 10 males. So then if you swap the brood around, you have a temporary flush of workers that now represent 30 males on average in each of these three resulting splits. So this is a method that we have been studying to try to imitate or simulate the effects of polyandry. And we've got some good results. Um, I think you have interviewed um, Lewis, my new colleague. Yeah, Lewis is great. Yeah, well, we did a study where we mixed uh, brood in colonies in this manner to mm -hmm. make an artificial polyandrous cohort of workers and we also fed them uh, traces of pollen with neonic and some oh, yeah. of them with yeah. control pollen without any neonic and we were interested in how the effects of mixing could uh, uh, mitigate the effects of neonics and here we show these this is the scatter of, of the data and this is brood survival you know how, how well mm -hmm. the brood survived and these two bars here are of interest these are the colonies that received mixing uh, without neonic and mixing with neonic and in both cases the effective mixing was strong enough to elevate brood survival even mm -hmm. in the presence of neonic so this suggests that even in a simulated polyandrous condition, we can affect some of its benefits. Can you explain that? It's a temporary expression of polyandry. But I, I get that, but can you explain these results my, because of polyandry? My guess would be we now have 30 different genetic lines in each of these colonies instead of 10, which and means... It gives, gives you the possibility of another... Uh, a lo another line or two that's able to yes. survive or overcome. Yes, it's okay. a probability game. We are increasing the probability that there are patra lines there that are able to detoxify foreign substances or able to remove and recognize foreign substances or uh, s remove themselves from nurse duty altogether because they have been subjected to an insecticide. Okay. Get, a thousand different genetic possibilities, but the point is we have given these colonies more genetic variation than these. Okay, a little, little this subject, a little different. Explain to me, I believe that when I mix brood in a split, I have better queen acceptance. Can you explain that to me? It's possible that you are increasing the principle against 
nepotism. When you okay. have a highly related cohort of workers, there's always the danger that they will be more particular in the type of queen that they accept or that they feed. But if you have a genetically diverse workforce, that effect of nepotism just gets diluted away. Makes sense. Perfect sense, yeah. That would be my guess. Yeah. There's a lot going on here that we don't understand. Well, I, here's another thing that excites me about polyandry, and, and, and Bob, why I think we need to mainstream this into bee breeding. It is conceptually so simple. Yeah. So simple. Think about it. Classical breeding, you have to select a colony. You have to propagate the virgins. You have to try to control the drones they mate with and hope for the best at every step. And you might get 10% of your product that's actually expressing the product at the end of the day that you were hoping for in the first place. Yeah. It's outrageously inefficient. Polyandry is the conceptual opposite of that. It is anti-breeding. We are selecting instead for queens that carry the maximal different versions of each gene that we can possibly cram into their spermatheca. So it's easy. It's easy. You can inseminate them. You can mix brood. You can promote big drone congregation areas and mimic the same results that are achieved through heroic efforts in classic breeding. So I consider it a win-win and I encourage breeders and beekeeper groups uh, to get more familiar and comfortable with instrumental insemination. You know, it works. I'm interested in the possibility of breeding for promiscuous queens. Absolutely. In I, fact, I, I meant to ask that question <laughs> when you were talking, and then it slipped my mind. And it'd be conceptually easy to do. You could, um, you know, just simply inseminate and rear a bunch of virgins, and and uh, then you know genotype their worker offspring. It's non-lethal. You're genotyping her workers, not her. Yeah. And you know, continue to select from those lines that mate with the more males and I think it's kind of fun too. think of the marketing possibilities what kind of what kind of, well, what, kind of yeah. <laughs> what name would you call that queen lion yeah. <laughs>